Csönszak legyenek. Good morning, Family Faith Tabernacle. Welcome to all of you that are in the house and those of you who are joining us online. We welcome you today. Please, if you're um, watching later, hashtag replay so that we know that you are on here. And we'd like to reach out to you and touch base with you because you are just as much a part of the family as those that are here. So we thank you for coming. So I'm just going to do uh, announcements real quick, and then um, Reverend Jenny will come up and do um, tithes and offerings. So don't miss out. Every Tuesday, we have our um, Tuesday devotionals at 630 on Facebook and on Instagram. These are very encouraging, quick words. They're three to five minutes, so it doesn't take a lot of time. You know, um, I learned uh, yesterday when I went to a, a service that uh, even adult attention span nowadays is one minute. One minute. Oh because we are so used to instant, instant, instant. So we don't keep you too long. We try to get it out three to five minutes, and it's just a quick um, a bite. It's a snack to keep you going. <laughs> so don't miss our midweek service on Wednesday. Um, those are not on Facebook Live, but come out and join us. They're very personal. Um, I'm really enjoying the Bible study that we're having Um it's, it's very encouraging. We get to talk about the word that we're learning that night and applying it to our life. And I'm hearing great things about our youth that are happening on Wednesdays as well. So um, be prepared. You guys are going to be seeing more of our youth. And then um, the first Sunday of every month, we have our Family Sunday Fun Day. And um, come out and bring our lunch. So after service, we can fellowship. Go grab something, come back, or just pack it and bring it. Those are kind of geared towards our kids. That's gone. Galentine's is over. <laughs> <laughs> it is postponed. It is over. <laughs> Want to make sure you guys save the date for our special service with Bishop Sean O'Neill. That's going to be Sunday, April 10th at 6 p.m. Several other churches are going to come and join in celebration with us. Um, this is when they are going to officially uh, launch us as a church, not a church plant anymore. So we will be officially standing on our own two feet, <laughs> which we have been doing. We're okay. And then Easter basket blessing. So please um, bring donations of candy, any kind of Easter items. We just want to bless our families. We have seven houses right here next to us, and so that's where we want to start. And we can always grow from there, but we want to bless the six on this side and the one on the other side with just a candy full of blessing from the church because we're neighbors. And then also on um, April 24th, we are going to have Pastor Josh Montgomery um, come. He is uh, at this time our standing overseer um, because Pastor Phil uh, moved to North Carolina, Georgia, Georgia to Georgia. He moved to Georgia to be with his um, his kids and his grandkids, and um, so he retired from um, California um, and is working out there now. So Pastor Josh Montgomery is our over standing in overseer for right now, maybe permanently. But anyways, you want to come out. He has um, a very special way of teaching. It's it's very um, I don't know what the word is. You'll enjoy it. You'll enjoy it. So just come on out and, and be with us on that day. And at this time, I'm going to ask Reverend Jenny to come up and do the tithes and offering it's part of our worship. So it's important that we reverence God in, in our giving. I like that song that we sang. I don't want to miss one word you speak. This thing on. Yeah. <laughs> Quiet my heart, I'm listening. Yeah. So, you know, so are we listening? Do we want to hear more of God's word? In a moment, we're going to be taking up the offerings. But first, I want to read Malachi 3.10. This is a familiar verse for most of us. But there's more there. We just need to listen what God's saying here. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. 
Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. He's presenting a challenge to us. If we bring our tithes into the house, present them before him, then he follows with a challenge. Try me in this, if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing more than you can contain. He's asking us to have faith in his word. Don't want to miss one word you speak, right. Father. He said, try me, see if I can do what, do with your gift. See what I can do with your gift. You know, he can do a lot more with that little bit of money that we give than we could ever do with it. Amen. And it doesn't even make sense in my logical mind. Right. But God doesn't always make sense in my logical mind either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he can do things that I could not do. He's provided for me things that I could not, with the finances I have, be able to do. Right. But he's provided those things. It's God's desire to not only bless us, past the point of having room enough to receive it. That's that's what, you know, more right. than we can contain. Right. More than we've asked for. More than we've dreamed about, you know. So how do we ex assess this blessing? By faith. Yeah. Amen. By believing that he can, he will do what he says in his word. Amen. Right. Amen. If we choose to obey and trust in his word, and accept his challenge, he'll prove his word faithful every time. Amen. Amen. Father, today I bring my tithe and my gift into the storehouse. I believe in your word where it says you will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. I stand on it. I have faith in it. I act on my faith today. And I watch in anticipation for the fulfillment of your promise. Amen. Thank you, Father. Yes. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you can look back and, and see where God has had his hand on your life? Yep. Your, your entire life, all your days. Even this week. Even this week. Even this week. <laughs> even last night. You know, as, as Sister Jenny was saying, um, God presents us a challenge in, in Malachi. And uh, he says, try me in this. Right. It's the only place in the Bible where God says, I dare you. I triple dog dare you to try me in this. Right. You know, and as human beings, like Pastor Don was saying, our, our attention span is getting less and less as we get so used to instant gratification mm -hmm. in this world. You know, we got microwavable meals, we got fast food drive throughs We're not used to having to wait for anything. In other words, we're spoiled. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I can look back at my life where God's put it on my heart to, to sow a seed, a seed above and beyond what, what, I, what I normally do, or a, a special offering, or, or bless someone with something, something that had value to it, and God put it on my heart to get rid of it. And... Um, it seems, it seems that uh, quite a few times after that moment happens, mm -hmm. something else happens, and I'm like, oh, man, I should have held on to it. Yep. Right? I could have used that. Yep. You know, immediately, the enemy tries to get in your head, and you know, I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. Or nothing happens. Right away. Right away. And, and months go by, even years go by, and you're like, Lord, I don't understand. Why, why am I struggling? I, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. You know, how many of you know, I mean, don't, I'm not too familiar with farming, but I, I do know that when you plant a seed, sometimes it takes time for that seed to germinate. For that seed to germinate, to grab roots, and to sprout up, and to start yielding fruit. It's the same thing with, with, with the kingdom of God. Sometimes things that we sow into the kingdom, we don't automatically see an increase. Sometimes things we sow, we never see an increase. You know, there are things that you sow into people's life that you may never reap the fruit of. Right? Recognize. Or recognize. But we're not called, we're not called to reap the benefits. We're called to sow the seeds. And it's the same thing with our finances into the kingdom. Um, you know, and, and last night, 
those of you in here know, but last night we, we had a pretty, let's just say, uh, exciting night. <laughs> I get a, a phone call from, from Pastor Don. She's like, the police are outside. The police are outside. And I'm like, oh, I guess I'm getting up now. <laughs> and, and, and I get up and, and I go to the front door and uh, sure enough, the police are outside and something didn't seem right. And I look and, and her Yukon's in the neighbor's garden. A car plowed into it and push it into the neighbor's yard and, you know, and obviously it's a distraction. Because that's what it's intended to be. It's intended to be a distraction. Right. You know, there, there was a gentleman who was making poor decisions and, and driving when he shouldn't have and, and, and he hit her car. And, and now, all of a sudden, the cares of life come in. You know, we have a calling on our life. We have a purpose. We know that God's ordained each and every one of us to do certain things. And... From time to time, there will be distractions that present themselves. I mean, it's up to us whether we harbor these distractions or we trust God. Right. And someone, I don't know who was saying but they mentioned the verse. And babe, I don't have it in my notes. If you would pull up Romans 8.28, yeah. popular verse. Gotcha. But sometimes we just don't understand why we go through the things that we go through. And, yeah. and sometimes we might even be tempted to think, Lord, Lord, why have you forsaken me? But the Bible is true, and the Bible tells us that God will never leave us nor forsake us. The Bible also tells us that God is not a man, that he should lie. And in this verse, it tells us, and we know now that all things work together for good to those who love God. Yeah. Pastor Nod, do you love God? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so she, th th this verse would apply to her. So all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. How many of you in here are going through financial hardship? I mean, I think we can, we can all raise our hand. I mean, many of us are, I mean, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but food's gone up, gas has gone up. Yeah, yeah. I actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys have noticed, but food's gone up, gas has gone up, rent's gone up. Pretty much everything's gone up except for um, our, our, our finances, right? Yeah. And do you guys know that that is also meant to be a distraction in your life? This, this isn't my message, this will be my intro, but there are plenty of opportunities to get our eyes off of God and onto the problem. You know, in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, you can put that up there, it's not on the screen, but Paul tells us to seek him first, him being who? God. God. Seek God first and his kingdom. Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We're never, we're not meant, we're not created to worry. We're not created to stress out. We're not created to be distracted. We're created with a purpose to have fellowship with God and to trust him. God wants us to trust him. But sometimes it's stinking hard, isn't it? Right? I can say stinking, right? It's not bad. Some, sometimes I say some questionable words, I have to apologize. Um, sometimes it's stinking hard because you're looking at a problem. Mm -hmm. You're looking at a problem that's chasing you <laughs> down, you know, like, for instance, let's go back to David and Goliath. The children of Israel were looking at a problem. Right. And each and every soldier looked at that problem and counted that problem greater than God. There was one young man who looked at that problem and counted God greater. And so when I get into this message this morning, we talked about our identity in Christ and the authority of a believer. And last week we kind of closed, or two weeks ago, we kind of closed with, we are the only ones getting in our way. Do you guys know that you were designed for greatness? Amen. You are called to greatness. God has a calling for each and every one of us to excel beyond our own abilities, just like David to do something that we can't do in our own strength because he gets the glory. There are so many things that we are capable of. In fact, we close by saying, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but we are called to live a limitless life. Mm -hmm. God never intended for there to be limits on us. He intended to pick up where our abilities stop. Right? And to do that, it takes faith. Let's see, where am I going to start? Okay. What was that? Probably at the top. Probably at the top? I was going to start in the middle, you smarty pants. 
So God wants to take you to the next level. You guys, you guys all, all agree with that? Yes. You guys have heard that. I mean, there's the, even the world thinks that way. The next level. You can buy self-help books and yeah. Tony Robbins books. You can buy all these self-improvement, self-reflection books to take you to the next level. If I say God wants to take you to the next level, listen to me for a second. It's really easy to hear that and be like, all right, my blessing's coming, or my next season's coming, or something's coming. It may not necessarily be monetary things. I'm sorry if you don't want to hear that. But the first thing we think about that is some kind of monetary or, or societal promotion, right? I'm going to the next level. New friends, new houses, new cars, new dreams. Mm -hmm. God wants to take you to the next level so he can use you. God wants to take you to the next level for his glory. Amen. There may be blessings involved. There may be uh, finances involved. But the main focus is his glory. Yeah. God wants to use you for his purpose. And when we're kingdom eye, we go back to Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. When we're focused on that and being kingdom minded about being used for God's glory, we have a promise from the word of God that all these other things that we tend to worry about, that I tend to worry about, that everyone who raised their hand tends to worry about, I'm, I'm assuming, but I think I'm, it's a fair assumption, all those other things that we are worried about shall be added to us. Basically, you take care of me, buddy, and I'll take care of you. Do you guys think that that's a scripture we can hold on? Let me rephrase that. Is that right there a promise that we can hold on to? Yes. Absolutely. Is that there a promise that we can stand on? Yes. Yes. So just like when Jesus looked at Peter and said, come, is that a word that we can stand on and walk on? Yeah. Yes. But we get distracted. It's another way where we, we're the only ones that get in our way. Why? Because we talked last or two weeks ago, last time I shared, and the week before that. What is the one weapon that the enemy has? Yeah. Deception. Deception. So his one weapon is he's going to get you to go, uh, hey, Don, uh, what are you going to do now? <laughs> Surely you can't afford a, a brand new Yukon. Those are like $80,000. Yeah, nope. What are you going to do? So the first thing he does, he takes that weapon of deception and he tries to deceive you into thinking, believing anything but this verse. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe you need to change your focus for a minute from what God has for you to do and focus on yourself. Make sure you're taken care of and then you can jump back into the work of the ministry. Because that's what we tend to do as believers. Right? right? Yeah. We have a call, we're stepping out, we're working for God, we're serving God, we're doing things for God, and then life hits and, oh, okay, y'all, oh, oh, time out, I gotta go take care of this. And did you know it's not even crises anymore? It could be entertainment. Yeah. There's many people that don't go to a midweek service because they don't want to miss, I might be dating myself, American Idol. I don't know if it's still on TV, but I remember a time when people wouldn't come to midweek service because they couldn't wait to see who was going to win American Idol. Okay, the season's over. I can go back to midweek service. That's how far we, we, we've fallen as, as believers. Yeah. But more often than not, for, for us, in our you know, for me, let me, let me just go back. Huh, I'm not going to assume anybody. For me, it, 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 it's some kind of worldly responsibility. You know? Robbie, you, you got this, you got that. You know, you're going to have to hunker down. You're going to have to focus on this, and then you can focus on trusting God and, and doing the work of the ministry. Has anybody ever been there? Yeah. God never wanted us to get sidetracked or distracted by the things of the world. Mm -hmm. God's whole desire is that we trust him wholeheartedly. You know, I <laughs> I have a daughter. She shall remain, remain nameless. <laughs> and when she was a, 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 young, a young little whippersnapper, she was about yay big. And I would take her and I would throw her up in the air. And people would look at me like crazy because I mean I'd throw her high. I'd go like twelve feet in the air. And I'd just throw her up there and she would just have the biggest grin and she'd come down and catch her and she would just be ah. Never, ever, ever once was there ever a thought in her mind that I would ever drop her. Yeah. Not once. 
I never dropped her, thank God, because that's how God wants us to trust him. Mm -hmm. That there's not a chance, no way, no how, no uh, ain't going to happen that he will let us down or go back on his word. So when I open up by saying, how many of you know that God, you can look back and see where God's hand has been on your life? I can too. But there have been seasons of this life where I've gone, Lord, where the heck are you? What the fooey? Right? Can I, can I can say fooey, right? <laughs> Lord, where the heck, where, where, where are you? But then when years down the road, I look back and go, oh. Lord, I see. Yeah. I, I see now. But sometimes when we're, when we're going through, we've got the blinders on, and we're yeah. so focused on what's in front of us. Now, when, uh, years ago I started, and I'm sure you can apply this to many different things, but years ago I started mountain biking. I haven't done it for some time, but I got really into mountain biking. You know, had a fancy dancy bike, and I mean, we have disappeared for six mountains, and and I was training myself on how to be a better mountain biker. I mean, you're in the mountains, and the trail might be this wide. Right. And you're in the middle of nowhere, and you're going over boulders, and, and sometimes you're going fast, and sometimes, you know. But you got all this terrain to go over. And I was having a hard time going over rocks and, and doing drop-offs. And I really struggled until I was riding with this guy up in Simpson Park, um, actually. And uh, I was riding. He's like, hey, you're, you're doing this all wrong. It's like, what do you mean I'm doing it all wrong? Because I kept crashing and going off the cliff. So you're focused on what's right in front of you. You can't do that. I was like, what do you mean? He's like, you cannot do that. You have to focus on where you want to go. And I learned over time that as you're mountain biking, you're not looking right in front of your tire. You're looking at where you want to go, and your body will naturally lead you to what you're looking at. And it's the same in our walk with God. God never intended us to be so focused on the problem or the obstacle in front of us that we lost sight of where we're going. He wants us to keep our eyes on him, keep our focus on him, and our, and our life will naturally go that direction. But we tend to go, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I preach to the choir here, you know, because I'm, I'm just saying, yeah, I got highs and lows too. Like, yes, God's got me the next day. Lord, where the heck are you? We all, we all go through the, the struggle. But back to the message. So if you would turn to Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Is that my mic? That better? Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, the word tells us that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. You know, uh, just to stop right there, if you want to know the heart of God and the will of God, we just have to read his word. And reading this verse right here, we can see that Jesus did something in particular. He went around healing some of the sickness and some of the disease amongst all the people, right? Oh. No, that's right. It says he went around healing every every sickness and every disease. So if you're ever wondering if it's really God's will for you to be healed or if it's God's will for you to walk in divine healing, I want you to meditate on this verse because we know the heart of God. We know the will of God. The will of God is that every sickness and every disease would bow to the name of Jesus. And if you're struggling in that area, I understand because we struggle. If it's a financial problem, we focus on the financial problem. If it's, if it's a healing, we focus on the symptoms or the ailments. I understand. But the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And the more we read the word of God, the more we understand the heart of God. And the more we understand the heart of God, we understand the will of God. Right? And I'm going to get way too far in my message, so I'm going to keep reading here. <laughs> That might turn into a different message. And then verse 36, he said, But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like having sheep, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So Jesus is looking around, and he's moved with compassion. Because he sees to what, as what he describes, as like sheep having no shepherd. So I saw this, this meme or video or gif, I don't even know what they're called anymore, 
This tidbit of data in video format on Facebook, and it's a, a group I follow called The Laughing Christian. And it was, it was a video. I, I wish I could find it and have you put it up there. It said, this is me with, <laughs> when Jesus saves me. And it's a picture of a sheep, right? And he's stuck in a trench. And, and the shepherd's there, and he's, he's grabbing the sheep, and he's trying to get him out, and he's struggling with him, and the sheep's stuck in the trench, and he's wiggling, 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 and then finally, boom, he pulls him out, and the sheep's so happy, he takes three jumps, and boom, right back in the trench. <laughs> and that's been my life story a time or two, you know? But it shows us just how much a sheep needs a shepherd. In fact, sheep are one of the few creatures where if you release them back in the wild, they cannot survive on their own. They need a shepherd. Otherwise, they just wander and they'll get in trouble. And It's like putting a, a snack out for the, for the wild animals. A, a, a sheep, is that, is that the same? Oh, yeah. A sheep needs a shepherd. Because without it, they have no hope. They have no guidance. They have no direction. So, so the Lord says, pray therefore, that, that pray, therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You see, see how far I want to get ahead of this. Jesus looked out when he was moved with compassion because he realized that humanity without a savior is lost and hopeless. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know why he's been doing that. So Jesus is our shepherd. Oh, that's loud. Jesus is our shepherd and our only hope and means of salvation. You see, you guys, there is a work for each and every one of us to do because we have the answer that the world needs. Yep. Right? And if we have an answer, you know, the Bible tells us you have freely, you have freely received, so freely give. Right? Is that how it words it? Yeah. As you have received, so freely give. So we have the answer, and we're called to give this answer and to spread this good news to those who are scattered abroad. Amen? Mm -hmm. But we are living in a time, and I'm sure it's always been like this. I don't know. I'm only 41 years old. But we're living in a time to where we are hoarding. We live in a hoarding culture, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the United States. We live in a hoarding culture where I've heard this years ago from another minister where we're like the only nation that has storage storage units because we just hoard we collect we gather we consume right and and by default some christians do the same thing with the message of the gospel they're like oh great that's good news awesome oh it's all mine heaven right right we were never called to keep it and hide it for ourselves we're called so so freely we have received it we're called to freely get it and the Lord's telling us here, pray that there would be laborers to send out into the harvest. And we look around this valley, I mean, not even this valley, I mean, we look in this world today. And wouldn't you agree that the harvest is plentiful? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are people that need Jesus. Yeah. And how am I going to go on from this one? <laughs> in Romans chapter 10, verse 14. Out of the New King James, the word says, How then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Now I know what some of you are thinking. And I, I'm not a mind reader. I just know what some of you are thinking. And some of you are thinking, well, that's not, that's not particularly my... My ministry, I mean, thank God there are those who are called to go to the streets. And I would like to tell you, and hopefully we can prove to you in this service, that each and every one of you are called to preach the gospel. Right. <laughs> there are some people who have, have uh, evangelistic ministries, like Billy Graham, where they preach to thousands and thousands of people. That's probably not going to happen for everybody. But each and every one of us has a circle of influence that we are influential over. Yep. No, even, even some of you may not think so. But there is always somebody watching you, and there is always someone you can reach, and you are called to reach them. Let me rephrase that. You are called to plant seeds. Right. We have an assignment. In Mark chapter 16, this is my, many of you know this is the Great Commission, and this is my favorite, my favorite, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? 
my favorite way it's versed in all the Gospels. Okay. And it's uh, Matthew, or it's Mark, chapter 16, verse 15. The one they tried to bend. And he says, and, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, and they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. You see, this is more than this is a great commission that, that Jesus left his disciples. And it wasn't just for his disciples, because the verse right here says, and I shouldn't have put my glasses down. It says, these signs will follow all those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. And I'm not going to turn here, but as I was reading this a, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was reading, actually, it was actually we were on uh, vacation. When me and my wife were down there. I was reading the book of Acts, and I was reading when... Uh, they, they, they chose seven to serve tables. You see, there, there was a time when there was a, another sect of people who were upset because the, the widows weren't getting their daily distribution, and the disciples were, I'm paraphrasing here, and the, the, the disciples were like, well, it's not good for us to leave the Word of God and tend to them, so let's pray that there would be, let's pray for seven people full of the Holy Spirit. Well, of those seven people, the Bible mentions two. One of them is Stephen, and one of them is Philip. And what stood out to me this time as I was reading the passage, how many of you like it that you can read a passage multiple times and get something new about it every time? So I was reading this passage. Every other time I've read this passage, um, and there was always an emphasis on they asked for those people to be full of the Holy Spirit. You know, and it was a reinforcement of see the necessity of being filled with the Spirit because it empowers you to serve. It empowers you to serve people. It empowers you to do the work in the ministry. And as I'm reading this, 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 this passage this time, something else popped out to me. They were, they were chosen to serve tables and to oversee the distribution to the widows, right? But if you go on reading in that chapter, it talks about all the miracles that they did. So this great commission is backed up once again in God's word, where it wasn't just for the 12 disciples to go out and lay hands on the sick. It was for each and every person who believed. Because if you read on about, about Philip and Stephen, both of them were performing miracles and healing people. And that commission has never come to a stop. What it is, is we have, have lost sight of it as a church. We have become so preoccupied with, with uh, what's the word? luxuries. That we have lost sight of it. We've, 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 how many of you have gone to, I know Marianne has, how many of you have gone to like a third world country? Third world country? Have you gone to a church service in a third world country? Are they the hungriest people you've ever seen? Yep. They come on trains and boats and skateboards and, and bicycles. No, they'll, they'll do whatever they have to do to get to that service. Why? Because they're expecting a move of God. They're expecting the power of God to be in that service. You see, there's a scripture in 2 Timothy chapter 3 where the Bible tells us that in the last days, perilous, perilous times will come. And to paraphrase, it will say there will be a form of godliness, but denying its power. Now that scripture right there is specifically talking about the power that comes from the Holy Spirit to be able to cause you to live a regenerated and renewed life. Amen. But it's also the same power that rose Christ from the dead That's that right. dwells in you. Yes. And perilous times have come because as a church, we have begun so consumed with self that we have denied the power of God to be working in our, in our services, in our neighborhoods. Yep. You see, with the whole... Oh, man. I'll get back to my message. With the whole COVID-19 dilemma, mm -hmm. and <laughs> the church should have been the place where the sick were coming. Right. And we can look back and go... Well, we, we, can, we could always go back and Monday morning quarterback it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But really, the church should be the place where people come to get the power of God. Right. And it doesn't even have to be in here. It could be out there. It could be on the cheese aisle at Cedar Brothers. It could be anywhere. The power is in the believer. Right. Not in the building. So back to that verse. 
Mark chapter 16, or verse 15. And he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes will be baptized and will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. So, what's the main weapon of the enemy? Deception. Deception. So already when I read that scripture, some of you, myself included, might be having doubts. What are some of the doubts we can have? How about, I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too shy. I'm too scared. I'm not equipped. That's, that's not really my calling. You see, I, I, I'm called to serve behind the scenes. That's a very common one. That, that was mine when I first became born again. I'm called to serve behind the scenes. I thought my whole calling in life was to go to third world countries and build churches because I could see a bunch of people I would never have to see again and pretty much be behind the scenes. The devil wants to get you to agree with a reason why that's not for you to do. And when it comes to laying on the hands on the sick, well, what if nothing happens? You're not called to make something happen. You're called to lay hands on them. That's right. right. God's the one that's going to make something happen, not you. So you do your part and let God do his part. Amen. <laughs> or, or what if I tell them about Jesus and they don't believe? It's not your responsibility right. to get them to believe. That's right. nope. It's our responsibility to give them an opportunity to make a choice. That's it. It takes all the pressure off. No, that was laughing at. Um, but, you, but we can't be moved by, by the what is. I remember a distinct time I was at Kaiser Permanente in Riverside, and there was this young man. I was at the pharmacy. I was picking up a medication. I don't remember if it was for the girls or for me or, or for who, but I was at the pharmacy, and there was this young man with, with, with uh, I'm not a doctor. I'm going to assume it was Tourette's or, or, Tourette's or schizophrenia. And he was acting... Um, just say he was having an episode. I'm not going to say he was acting inappropriate. I mean, obviously he was having some kind of episode. And I just felt empowered and, and this boldness to go lay hands on him. Yeah. You know, like, like that was the first time where I just felt empowered. Like, oh, this thing's going to go. So like any strong Christian, I got up out of my chair, walked over to him and walked right past him and walked out the door. <laughs> oh, no. But I didn't do it. Yeah. Because from the moment I got up, I'm walking to him, and there's all these things like, what are people, the main one was, what are people going to think, you weirdo? Right. You're in the middle of a hospital, and you're going to lay hands and, on, on, this, on, on, on this young gentleman? And I totally missed the opportunity, you know, because of those reasons. Well, what if nothing happens? What are people going to think? That was, they're all going to laugh at you. Who cares? Right. Young ones, who cares if they laugh at you? What did you say? People laugh at me all the time. Probably a lot of it's self-induced. <laughs> I'm just jealous of my dancing skills. In Mark chapter 16, verse 20, we talked about the fear. We talked about the fear of what will happen. Like, what if nothing happens? What if they don't believe? What if they don't get healed? What if, what if, what if, what if? So that passage, passage of scripture ends with verse 20 and says, As they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming his word through the company of signs. Amen. You see, God will do the confirmation. God will meet you where we're God will meet us where we're at when we step out. It's not up to us to confirm God's word. It's up to us to preach God's word. God will confirm his own word. Amen? Amen. All right. What time we got? We're good. Don't be crippled by the what ifs. Jason, you'll probably appreciate this one, but there was, there was a mighty man of sport. A mighty man of sport. And once upon a time, he said a phrase that stuck with me, and I'm going to repeat it. It said, you will miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Oh, yeah. Anybody know who that was? Michael Jordan. Right. Wayne Gretzky. Oh, oh. Wayne Gretzky, the great one, greatest hockey player of my time, 
said you will miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. The same thing is you will miss 100% of the opportunities you don't take to, heal, to, to lay hands on someone, to allow someone to experience the power of God. You know, and I loved it the way, <laughs> the way that, that, that guy Rex, that Rex Crane said it. We were at that, at that youth event. And, you, you know, because, how do I say this? Can I just be real? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you get people up there and, and, and they make it about them. You know, I have a healing ministry, you know, I have a healing ministry, and I do this, and, and, and I do that. You know, and that can happen. You know, the only thing you can, can be on someone for a specific thing for a certain amount of time, and I'm not saying that's not, but sometimes we make it all about us. And right. this gentleman <laughs> gets up there and he goes, do you want to get healed? And the woman goes, yes, okay. Do you believe Jesus can heal you? Uh, yes, because I can't heal you, but Jesus can. Right. And if I lay hands on you, Jesus is willing to heal you. Do you believe that? Yeah. Okay, Jesus, if you're in here, I'm going to lay hands on her and heal her. Just made it all about Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's it. Obviously, we knew Jesus was in the room because the word tells us that if two or more are gathered in his name, he's in the midst of them. But he just made it all about Jesus. And then the woman who came up, actually, it was a young man. I take it back. It was a young man who had broken his arm. And he was really bummed out because he could skateboard, but he couldn't surf because he couldn't get his cast wet. And these are real life problems that young people deal with. Right. I mean, so he goes up with his cast and he's like, do you believe it? Yeah, is there Jesus here in the room? So he lays, lays hands on the kid and he's like, huh, I feel better. And then he started like beating his arm around and he's like, I couldn't do this before. And he started clapping his hands. He's like, I couldn't do this before. He's like, okay, great. The next person is, was in line and he's like, do you want to get healed too? He's like, yeah. Okay, well you, you just, you just freely received, so now I want you to freely give. I want you to go lay hands on her. And so the kid that just got healed walked over and laid hands on her. It's not about the person. That's right. Oh. It's all about Jesus. <laughs> right? Keep it simple. But going back to what we, we talked about last week, we are the only ones that will that'll get in ourselves' way. At least, let me, let me talk about me. I am the main person who gets in, in my way. And usually it's my head. You know, Lord, you don't know when the due date is of that bill. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> but God wants us to go to places that we never imagined going on our own. You guys believe that? Yes, amen. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. Where it tells us, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, if you look back at the 12 people that Jesus chose to spend most of his time with, it's, it's like me and, me and, my, me and my, my group. <laughs> you know what I mean? Roughnecks and, yeah. and, and beatniks and fishermen, you know? Not the most desirable people of that time. So what that tells us is it doesn't matter your pedigree. It doesn't matter your family lineage. It doesn't matter what you did before Christ. It all matters about Christ working in you. Amen? Amen. I'm going to read that same verse out of the Amplified. And most of you know it's probably twice as many words. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 in the Amplified says, Just look at your own calling, believers. Many of you... No, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Not many of you were considered wise to human standards. Not many powerful or influential not many of high and noble birth, but God has selected for his purpose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, revealing their ignorance. And God has selected for his purpose the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, revealing their frailty. God has selected for his purpose the insignificant, base things of the world and the things that are despised and treated with contempt, even, if, even the things that are nothing, so that he might reduce to nothing the things that are. And then wrapping up the whole reason why is so that no one may be able to boast in the presence of God. See, God wants to, God wants to get glory through you. 
God wants to use you for his glory. Because Robbie, uh, not Robbie, God can take a Robbie and turn Robbie into glory for himself. Not that I'm glorious. I'm not glorious. I'm, I'm kind of a knucklehead, to be honest with you. But Robbie could, God could take me years ago, turn me around, and put me back into the same group of guys, and they're like, what is different about this? Something. At, at first, when I turned my life around, everybody's like, yeah, let's see how long this is going to last. And now everybody's like, all right, well, now there's a crisis or a problem. Who's the first person that comes to God? Me. Yeah. And not that I have the answer, but I know the one who has the answer. Amen. You know, so they'll come to you, and God will use everything. See, in Romans 8, 28, when it says, oh, God uses all things, makes all things work together, that means everything that you have been through, every stinking mistake you made, every bad decision, every bad action, every time you lost control of your tongue, God will use each and every experience in your life, good or bad, for his glory, if, if, if we let him. Mm -hmm. So what the scripture tells us is, your past doesn't matter. Your personality doesn't matter. You can be the shyest of the shy. I remember a gentleman who was shy and soft-spoken, and we'll get to him later, but his name was Moses. He was shy and soft-spoken. God called him to, to, to bring his children out of the land of Egypt, and the first thing he said, <laughs> are you sure, me? Right. I can't talk. Right. Yeah, you. Because out of your weakness, right. I will be made strong. That's right. Thank your pedigree doesn't matter, your neighborhood doesn't matter, and your your family influence doesn't matter, and your family finances don't matter. Mm -hmm. If God has called you, He will provide for you. If God has called you, He let me say this, if God has called you, He will promote you. Yeah. Seek Him first. Seek, 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 seek ye first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 2 First Corinthians chapter 2. It's a good verse. Verse 1. And brethren, when I came to you, did I not come to you with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God? For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but the, with, with the power of God. You see, Paul, many of you know Paul, of all people, Paul had extensive training in Judaism and, and things of the law. He was very well spoken. He was very well schooled. And he's telling them, hey, when I came to you, I didn't come to you with all my accolades. I didn't come to you with a college degree. I didn't come to you with a doctorate. I came to you as a man telling you about a greater man. And that's it. We don't, a lot of times we get held up by, a, a big one is, is addresses. I know the Bible says this, but I don't know where it says it, so I'm afraid to say it. Right. It never had an address when it was written. Right. It was a letter. Right. Just think of it as a letter. Well, in the letter to, to the Corinthians, God said this. Even if you don't know it was the Corinthians, in God's word, it says this. You see, the power is not on you and remembering addresses. The power is solely on the word of God. And God will confirm his word. Right? right? Yeah. We, a few weeks ago, we shared Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where Paul said, I am not afraid, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is for it. For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Notice it does not say that good works and good behavior is the power under salvation. It says the gospel alone is the power unto salvation. Right. And then we read also in Colossians, I'm going a little fast for time's sake. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, the word says, Because of the confident hope of expecting that which is reserved and waiting for you in heaven, you previously heard of this hope and the message of truth. The gospel regarding salvation, which has come to you, indeed, just as in the whole world, the gospel is constantly bearing fruit and spreading by God's power. All the power is on the gospel. And a lot of times we keep our mouth shut and we don't do what God's put on our heart because we don't think we're smart enough or equipped enough or skilled enough or charismatic enough. 
You know, I would... <laughs> I joke about the cheese aisle a lot, but I watched a, I watched a man of God who would make a blubbering fool out of himself for Jesus any day of the week. Am I right? Yep. He didn't care who was watching. He didn't even care. That was a man who was, who, who was totally open about, I don't know any addresses in the Bible. Don't ask me the address. I know what the word says, but I couldn't tell you where to find it. And he took that, he took what he knew, he took the word, and he would go and just, gosh, it was embarrassing sometimes, wasn't it? Yes. It's like, good Lord, man, would you just shut up? I'm trying to eat my, my cheeseburger, and you're yeah. talking to every table around us. You know what I mean? But that's the way we should be. But we, we get in our own way because we get stuck in our head. You know, so, so Moses, he saw himself as unqualified. And God chose him so that through his weakness, God, God would be made strong. But there's a couple, if you want to read it, I'm not going to go there. I was going to, but it's in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. And then David. David's another one. You see, Samuel went, went, called Jesse and told him he had to go pick out a king that God was going to show him. So he called Jesse and he said, hey, oh, pretty good. Okay. Well, I guess I'll turn there. <laughs> oh, you're good. I'm just, I didn't know it was up there. Where, where are you at? Verse 1? Okay. What verse is that? That's one. Okay. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long have you mourned? How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Once again, Samuel's already getting into his head. Well, <laughs> what if he finds out he's going to kill me? That's the first thing we do. God will tell us to do something. We, we respond by every reason why, why we don't think we should. Right? I, I do it too. So back to verse uh, back to verse 2. And Samuel said, how, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. But if the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. See, sometimes we have to take the first step. And right here, Samuel had to take the first step. You just go, and then I'll show. Say, same thing to Abraham. Go away from your father's country to a land I will show you, and then. So sometimes we have to take the first step of faith, and then God meets us there with the rest, rest of the mission. Right. So, verse 3, Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Skip me down to verse 6, I believe. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then jump down to verse 10, Ben. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to, to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? So God told me to come here. He was, going to appoint, he was going to appoint for me a king from your sons. And you brought all your sons. Something's missing. Are all your sons here? And then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes. So he sent and brought him. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. Does anybody know what ruddy means? I'm thinking like lengthy, scaggly. What does ruddy mean? Dirty? dirty? So it was a dirty boy. He <laughs> <laughs> was a dirty boy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from, from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So Samuel has the opportunity to see each and every son of Jesse. So him being a, a, a logical man is, is evaluating each son that comes before him and goes, oh, maybe it's you. Oh, it's got to be you. Maybe it's you. It was the least person that, that Samuel, the least of, of these. The least of the sons. The, the last person Samuel would think. And, and it's funny because that's kind of like a foreshadow of our Messiah. 
See, the Jewish generation, the Jewish people, were they were expecting a mighty king, a mighty warrior to come riding in and, 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 and clean the house. They weren't expecting a lowly carpenter. Another example was, uh, let's see, where am I at? Was Saul. <laughs> if you want to turn, turn, baby, go to Acts chapter 3. So, so Saul was going around. You guys know in the early church, Saul was going around persecuting Christians. He actually got permission to drag them out and take them. He was actually there at Stephen's, at Stephen's murder when he was martyred. And verse 3 says, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Now, how do you know Paul had a long career of doing this? His whole life, all he did was go around and attacking Christians and persecuting them. Yeah. And that was, just, that was the, just the beginning of a long ministry. You see, he started off down the wrong road. He started off persecuting the church. Right. He started off as an enemy of the church. And God took the last person you would ever think possible, <laughs> turned him around, and sent him out to, evan to evangelize the Gentiles throughout all of Asia Minor. He had more impact out of that man than any other person in the New Testament, other than Jesus, obviously. The last person you would think. If you go to, if you go to chapter 9, verses 17 through 22, after he was on the road to Damascus, and he was converted, and Elias laid hands on him, he got his eyesight back. And then in verse 17... Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened, and Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus, and I believe the next... And immediately he... Preach the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So, I'm going to stop there and we'll, we'll keep going. So, he went from one week dragging Christians to be beaten and persecuted, to getting converted on the road to Damascus, getting his eyesight back, and immediately he turned around and started preaching Jesus. Could you imagine if you were one of those people running from him? Like, what do you think? I'm nuts. I'm not falling for that, right? What's well, exactly what happened? Because he was the one they were all afraid of. He was the one they were all running from. And now the next time they see him, he's preaching the same Jesus. Because God can take anyone, turn them around, and mold them for his purpose. Amen. So keep reading. So in verse 21, that all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? He's like, this is the dude. This is the dude that's been after us. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that Jesus is the Christ. I cannot imagine the amount of time it took to... Okay, I got a rabbit trail for you guys. I'm going to land this rabbit trail. So, I have a cat. I have a work cat. Somehow I got a work cat. There was a little cat under my trailer at work, and he looked all skin and bones, and, and, and I was going to, I felt bad for you guys, so I started feeding it. Well, how many of you know if you feed a cat, it's not going to leave? Yep. So now i got this cat at work, and I've been feeding it and nursing it back. Well, I decided to trap it and take it down to get fixed, so I did that Friday. I trapped the cat, took it down to get fixed, because I don't want a bunch of cats under my trailer. And the cat was mad at me, right? I don't know why. <laughs> so I let the cat go. And the cat kind of stayed, and like I was like building this trust. Can you imagine the amount of time it took to for for Saul to build the trust with the, with the disciples? Like literally, dude, you're the you're the one who's been trying to kill me, and, and you expect me to believe that all of a sudden you've been converted and now you love Jesus? Right. Yeah. My name's Paul now. <laughs> I'm not Saul. I'm Paul now. Yeah, exactly. So destroy the building. Don't you think it would have been easy for 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 Saul to be like? I understand that you want me to go do that, Lord, but you you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I what I was thinking to do to these people. You, you don't really, Lord, me. Let's not limit ourselves. Let's just move on God's word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
verses one through seven. I'll close with this one, or maybe the next one, but or the one after that. We'll see. But know this that in the last days, oh, I, I, I kind of mentioned this one earlier. Really. But know this that in the last days, perilous times will come. How many of you believe we're in the last days? Yep. I mean, I've, I've said it before, but this is bothering me. I'm sure when they came out with the first miniskirt, Christians were thinking that, oh, these must be the last days. <laughs> right? But I think what we're seeing now is just, I can't imagine it. I mean, watch what I say, but. I can't fathom what it would look like if things keep getting worse the way they are. Right. Look how the cash society is becoming, the QR code and all. Yeah. I mean, it's just it, it's just rapidly progressing. And it says here that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. I'm just gonna sell that. I'm just gonna sum that whole verse up with lovers of themselves. Yeah. We become a nation that that's consumed with self. Self-identity, self-awareness, self, self, self. Now we're going to a point of, of transhumanism to where now it's all about self. Now we can live in a virtual reality where it's all about me. I can do whatever I want to do because now it doesn't really exist. I can be whatever I Right? Yeah. Do, you, do you understand the potential for depravity that that, that creates? Because now anything's possible because it didn't really happen. It's all make-believe. Right. Verse 3, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. How many of you know we're living in a time where good, good is absolutely good and truth. Anything anything that's truth and anything that's good is absolutely, absolutely despised by this world in this day and age. Yep. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, and having a form of godliness but denying its power. So I want to encourage us as a church. I know this scripture is talking about denying, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And that power is the power to live a regenerated life and to conquer sin in the flesh. Amen. But it's also the same power that rose Jesus from the dead. Right. The same Amen. power that empowers you to step out and stand on and move on the word that God, God's given each and every one of us. And regardless of the excuse, it's really no excuse. It's not too late. It's not too early. Young ones, you can reach people for Christ. Not, not as young ones. There's plenty of time left for, for, for us to do something magnificent for God. Amen? Amen? So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus. God. Lord, I just thank you that, Lord, we always have your word to go back to and turn to, God. Lord, when things don't make sense, God, and things don't quite quite add up, Lord, with, with, with the things that you birthed inside of us and that they don't make sense, Lord, and we can't figure out how how they're going to come to pass, Lord, and, and why would you, why, why, why you would call us, Lord. I just pray that you would help each and every one of us, Lord, just to take the first step. Yes, Lord. Just take the first step, God. Help us to take that first step and to stand out, yes, to step out on the things that you birthed on the inside of us, Lord, that we would trust in your word, Lord, trust in the word that you've given us, Lord. Hold on to, to your unfailing word, Lord. Lord, that we would grab hold of those callings and those dreams and those missions, God, that you put on each and every one of us, Lord, that we would leave here, God, that we would leave, leave these walls, Lord, empowered and refreshed and rejuvenated and on fire, God, that, that the fire of God would fall on each and every one of us, Lord, to do something amazing, yes. to do something miraculous, to do something beyond ourselves, God. Lord, to bring your power to the people on the streets, to bring your power to the people in the stores, Father. Lord, that we would have a new boldness, God, to, to not stand for any disease, any, 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 any sickness, Lord, that we would rise up and say, no, no, not on my watch. Father, that you would just birth this boldness, that we would, Lord, be mighty warriors for your cause, God. Lord, that, that we wouldn't look within ourselves, we wouldn't look within our own abilities, we wouldn't look within our own mind, our own knowledge, Father, that we would trust solely in you, Father. Lord, that your word would be enough, God. Lord, that your word would be enough for us to take that first step, to walk, to step out of that boat, to walk on that water, God, having our eyes totally fixed solely on you, Father. Lord, so I thank you for these examples, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for your unfailing word, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Goodbye, Facebook Live. Thanks for watching. If if you're